uneasy about the tendency to talk now in terms of a limited nuclear war, a winnable nuclear war, in the mistaken belief, uh, as I believe it to be, that once you start it, you can stop it before it goes the whole way. I don't believe you can. I don't think there can be any limited use of nuclear weapons. If a nuclear war starts, after the first nuclear explosion, the war will escalate to a total nuclear war. This is the logic of modern war and the character of modern weaponry. But if you believe in limited nuclear war, you also have to believe in things like crisis relocation, a plan drawn up by the Federal Emergency Management Agency in which 145 million Americans who live in cities and near military bases would, in the few days before a nuclear war starts, all be moved to someplace else in the country that the authorities have decided is going to be safe. Of course, for government agencies and senior officials, the plans are rather more elaborate. One of the places that figures in their plans is the Cary Salt Mine here in Hutchinson, Kansas. Digging out salt creates underground storage space, so Cary Salt Mine has a tenant. When underground vaults and storage started its business down here in 1959, nuclear war was in everybody's mind. And UVS made its living off that fear. And at that time, the uh, civil defense people told us that, you that it was required that you have 220 feet of overlay to sustain the largest bomb that they had at that time. Well, we're 650 feet deep. So I think that we could withstand a uh, virtually direct hit uh, and not affect the area down here. And yes, I'd come down here. But do you have the supplies to live on? That's the real question. Better here than there. Uh, I, would have, I would make do. What future archaeologists would find down here, apart from Mike Gingrich, is thousands of cartons of greasy restaurant receipts, kept for tax purposes, the original print of Gone with the Wind, and some very old bankers. U.S. government agencies are required by law to have emergency relocation sites. This is where the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City would reconstruct its records and start up the banking system again after a nuclear holocaust. The records are in the vault there, typewriters, emergency lighting system. It makes some kind of sense from the bank's point of view, I suppose, and it's relatively easy to protect bank records. But the main thing that would burn in a nuclear war is people, and they're much harder to protect. The Russian for civil defense is Grzhdansky Avaruna, but Russian cynics shorten it down to Grob. Grob is Russian for coffin. A whole bureaucratic empire has grown up here that bases itself on the pretense that Soviet citizens can be protected from a nuclear attack. It convinces some Western observers, mainly those who want to use it as an argument for still more Western nuclear warheads, but it doesn't convince Russians. What do you do when you hear the nuclear alert, asks a Russian. Put a sheet over your head and walk slowly to the cemetery, replies another. Why slowly? So you don't cause a panic. In Moscow, as in Washington, there are elaborate plans to protect the leaders, the generals, and the senior bureaucrats. After all, you could hardly have a war without them. But for the millions of ordinary Russians in this city and others, civil defense means simply evacuation, if there's time. Evacuation by bus, through railway stations like this, and for most people in long marching columns wending their way out beyond the suburbs, where if they're lucky and it's the right time of year, they'll freeze to death in the open fields before the fallout gets them.
Civil defense is silly and futile, but at least it's about trying to keep people alive. Nowhere does civil defense get even 1% of what we call defense budgets. The rest goes to inventing and building new and more efficient ways of killing people. There is a kind of a technological exuberance that uh, leads to solutions which are sometimes fancier than necessary, that uh, include capabilities which, are, which may not be particularly important, but which uh, involve, uh, but which are very clever, and uh, on occasion to provide solutions to problems that uh, either don't exist at all or which have been presented in a very exaggerated form. It's not just the fascination of the technicians and the scientists, of course. The push for new weapons also comes from industry, for which they can mean billions of dollars and millions of jobs. We've made great big business out of preparing for war, big business out of the military. And whereas in the old days we used to have to plead with the Congress to give us some money for our clothing factory or our shipyard, now it's industries all over the country leaning on their congressmen, uh, leaning on their senators, uh, trying to get jobs and profits for uh, the industries. Things work differently in the Soviet Union. Here there's no private companies trying to sell fancy new weapons to the government. The Ministry of Defense and the government as a whole decide what the country can afford. And then it's other government departments that actually design and manufacture the weapons. There's no profit motive, no military industrial complex here. And yet things work exactly the same in the Soviet Union. The new weapons spew out just as fast, and the real driving force on both sides is people's desire to advance their careers. If you're a colonel in the Pentagon or the Soviet Defense Ministry, and you want to become a general, you need to show success in getting your service more resources and weapons. If you're a scientist in Soviet or American defense industry, you get recognition by developing new weapons. And if you're an executive in a U.S. aerospace company or a bureaucrat in the Soviet Ministry of Heavy Machine Building, you get control over more resources. You climb up the career ladder, in other words, by bringing the scientists and the soldiers together. In the United States, it's called the military-industrial complex. Here they call it the Metal Eaters Alliance. And it all comes down to the same damn thing. These people are discussing how to cook their own goose. If you hold a senior command in the Soviet Strategic Rocket Forces or the American Strategic Air Command, then you have to believe that nuclear weapons are a good thing, that they're about peace and not war. Otherwise, you might conclude that you're in the wrong job. But once you've made that basic act of faith, it can be a fascinating job with lots of responsibility and intellectual challenge, especially if you're a civilian defense analyst with free license to speculate. I agree, sir. Interestingly, the nuclear weapon does exactly what uh, General Douay predicted in 1921, first theorist of air power. And he said, you want three things when you bomb. You want some HE, which was all they had then, high explosives, or TNT. And you wanted some fire bombs with it to start fires. And you wanted some poison gas bombs to prevent people from putting out the fires. Now, if you look at a nuclear weapon, he could have been prescient. Fire. Obviously, no moderately ambitious great power could afford to be without such a weapon. Britain tested its first nuclear bomb in 1952. 